Thank you for taking the time to view this message online. You can connect with us more through our comment section of this video, through our Facebook page, or through our website, nhgj.org. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm a member of the uh, congregation. Uh, you generally don't see me because I'm generally running sound upstairs where, uh, honestly, preferably nobody can see me if I do something wrong. Um, but today, Andy's given me the opportunity to uh, be able to preach on Revelation chapters four through five. Uh, so we'll go ahead and review a little bit of the previous um, sermons, and then we'll pray, and we will start talking about Revelation chapters four and five. So let's get started. Um, so previously, uh, last week, or week before last, I should say, um, Andy uh, talked us through the uh, seven letters to the seven churches. And previous to that, we had the sort of the, the introduction to Revelation, John being, um, talked, being given this commission to hear this vision, to see this vision. And um, then John, uh, just seeing this 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 risen Jesus, this amazing vision of Jesus, Jesus as as King, um, and as Lord. So that that's kind of how the uh, what we've been covering, and we're going to continue on in that same vein today. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we will get started. Uh, Lord Jesus, I pray that as we as we look at this revelation of you that we would keep our focus on you, that our focus would be drawn back to you. Um, Lord, draw our focus back to you through these words, through your words, and through this, this vision of you. Thank you. Amen. So, uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5, and we'll get to the, the reading of those, those texts in a little bit, um, opens up with this vision of, a, of this amazing throne room of the one seated on the throne. Um, it talks about what is about to happen or what must happen. Um, there's, there's just, and there are a lot of individual images and figurative language uh, th throughout this, uh, this section of text um, that, that kind of all add up to give us this spectacular image of the one seated on the throne and to the slain lamb. Um, and of course, it can be easy to take our eyes off the one seated on the throne um, and the lamb instead focus on maybe our ideas on even just in terms of, of the singing part of worship we're thinking about how we're singing rather than the one to whom we are singing um or maybe that something just wants to take our take our focus off onto sometimes sports sometimes our, our jobs sometimes um sometimes our shopping uh, or maybe even life controlling habits, but that this this text calls us back to where our focus should be to Jesus, um, because he's the only one who's worthy of our worship. He's the only King who is deserving of our worship and who is worthy. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and read from Revelation chapter four. Uh, this will be from the NIV. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, 
who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. While John is shown what's to take, just want to make a note here as we uh, finish up with chapter four. While John will be shown what is to take place after the letters, uh, the throne room, throne room scene actually appears to occur in the past and then move to the present um, because we, we, we end up moving, and we'll see this in chapter five a little bit more, but uh, we end up moving from this throne room scene to the Lion of Judah to, uh, a slain, to something else that's really surprising. Um, and again, we'll discuss that a little bit more when we hit chapter five. But for now, let's go ahead and think about some of the images uh, that we see here, th these, these really, really evocative images, because um, I think that's going to be a, a really useful way to start thinking about these chapters and about, about our worship. Um, so we, we just have this amazing imagery, and again, I'm not going to hit them all in detail. Uh, because there are so many images, uh, but I will give you, um, I'll go over a number of them and I'll give you what I think are the most probable meaning of the imagery. So, and it's going to be the, mo the, the most commonly held views of, of the imagery in uh, chapter four and then ultimately in chapter five. Um, so we have the one seated on the throne. So we have this scene starting out, the one seated on the throne, right? Um, we, we don't actually get a lot of description of the one seated on the throne, and we don't actually get a name, uh, if, if you notice that. There, there's not a name given. He's referred to throughout this one seated on the throne as the one seated on the throne. Um, so it says he's like, you know, like maybe Jasper and Ruby or Carnelian. Um, so he's kind of like, the, looks like these precious gems but that's the only description of the one we get seated on the throne, apart from him, you know, being seated on a throne that's in, in the middle of this throne room, um, like right in the middle of this throne room. He is the most important person in that throne room. Um, we have 24 elders. Uh, there are a few different views of who the elders are. Um, the most commonly held view which is also the one that I happen to agree with, uh, though, is that the 24 elders describe two groups, okay? So the first is that of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then the second is that of the 12 apostles. Uh, we do have a few other things going on with those elders. So for example, they're wearing th this white clothing, um, which may be referring to funeral clothing. Uh, generally, uh, folks who died, uh, especially in uh, Judaism, were, were clothed in white. Uh, so going even beyond that, their golden crowns are probably being given because they persevered in their, in their faith, even to death. So these are, these are representatives of the, 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 the dead in the 12 tribes of Israel and the dead in of the, and the dead 12 apostles, probably 12 apostles at this point, um, because Paul would have died and that would have left us with 12. Um, so we, we get to see this, this, that, that there are these, these, uh, Elders who, it encompasses both before the time of Jesus and after the time of Jesus, who persevere, who persevered and who are persevering uh, even, even to that point of death. And then we're going to have a slide here for the, the sea, because it's, it's a really interesting image to think about. So there, there, there's this sea around the one seated on the throne. And the sea, though, looks like crystal. It's, it's this incredibly calm, calm sea. Um, in ancient Near Eastern thought, uh, so that would include, you know, the, the Old Testament all the way up through the New Testament. When, when people think about the sea, they think of this chaotic um, and, and dangerous and frequently evil place. I, I, I mean, we have, uh, we have all kinds of folk, we have, we have folks who can, uh, forecast weather and whatnot and help it with storms. But even, even with that, we have, a, say, a hurricane going through the sea and you get a ship caught in that, um, it is going to do bad things to that ship. Um, so in, in ancient Near Eastern thought, it, it's, you know, similar, similar concept where, you know, they, they know that the sea 
is unpredictable. They, they don't have weather forecasters who are going to be able to easily forecast the weather or have satellite imagery. Um, but they, they see that the, the, the sea can quickly become something that is incredibly dangerous uh, and just chaotic. Uh, even the disciples who were you know, experienced fishermen were caught out in the storm, um, and, which Jesus then calmed. Um, here, the sea is already calmed, and it's to the point that it looks like crystal. It's not just that it's, uh, that it's, it's calmed and it's just moving around maybe a little bit. It, it, looks, like, it looks like this crystal sea uh, because of the one seated on the throne's power over this, this chaotic, dangerous force, um, which, which is just an amazing image for us, that of the one who is seated upon the throne, who even has power over the, the, the chaos and the danger in our own lives, that he, he, brings the, he can bring this, this calmness and this peace to it. Um, and we have the four living things. Um, now, when I think of the four living things, and this is probably because I'm really bad at craft projects, I, I tend to think of craft projects with, with the, the, these images and, and the faces of you know, the, the animals and the, the, the man. Um, when it says that they have eyes all around them, I tend to think of googly eyes, again, probably because I'm really, really bad at crafting. Um, not, not my thing. <laughs> I've tried. So, So, but in, in this case, that's not exactly what we're seeing. If you, if you see that, that's totally fine, though. I, that's what I see in my head when I read that. Um, and we're probably seeing allusions to the four living creatures in the throne room in, in Ezekiel. That's in, in chapter one of Ezekiel. Uh, we see, see this awesome image of the, of the throne room of God. Um, and, and these four living things are constantly singing about the, uh, of the holiness of God, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, just constantly singing or chanting, chanting this, this song uh, because he, he is the one who is holy, and so they have to sing this. It has to be sung. And, and then we see worship. Um, and whenever they do worship, whenever, say, the 24 elders worship, we, we see them fall before the throne and lay their crowns before them. These, these crowns that they gained, they're... they're they're, they're still subordinate to, and they still serve the one who is seated on the throne, e even though there are these amazing people who persevered even to the point of death. They're still laying their crowns before the one seated on the throne. That, that even as we persevere, as, as we grow in our faith, that, and especially as, as we grow in our faith, uh, we, we should be more and more likely to throw our crowns, put our crowns before the one seated on the throne and, and recognize just his awesome majesty. Um, there, there's another interesting point here where um, the one seated on the throne is called, you know, Lord and God. Domitian, uh, who was emperor when John wrote this, uh, demanded that people call him Lord and God. But there's, there's an addition here. So Domitian didn't demand that people call him the creator. But here we see in this song that... Domitian, uh, or that, that God is called the, the, the creator, where Domitian is not. Domitian, that, that emperor, is not. God is not just Lord and God, though he is. He, he's also the creator of all. He's the creator of Domitian. Domitian doesn't have any real power. And uh, that, that's kind of what we see. We see a contrast here with a, almost a parody of um, Domitian's throne room, uh, of the throne room of the Caesars, because... The, the one seated on the throne is the, is the true king, not Domitian, not the Roman emperor, not, for that matter, not our president. He's not the true king. The true king is the one seated upon the throne. It's also a relatively simple description. Um, it has a lot more in common with the Old Testament in that sense, because there are other scenes of heaven and of throne rooms in other Jewish writing from that period, that, that period of time that we, you know, so about late, late 90s uh, AD. Um, 
but th there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple description, and these other descriptions are generally a lot more flowery, a, have a lot more going on in them than what's occurring here in, in, the, revel in the revelation given to John that is of Jesus. Um, we also see here mentioned in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, the seven spirits of God. Um, most commonly, scholars and folks, folks who like or really good with Revelation uh, will say that that's probably referring to the Holy Spirit. So we're not just seeing the one seated on the throne. We are seeing the Holy Spirit up in heaven as the seven spirits of, of God. All right, let's go ahead and go on to chapter 5. Uh, and this will introduce us to uh, uh, some really, really, really good points. So, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to open it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, that's a lot, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's talk about that scroll. So there, there, there's this scroll with seven seals. Uh, and uh, we should have a picture of a scroll up on the screen. Um, so six seals on a scroll were generally used for legal documents. Uh, this is according to Craig Keener, who is a New Testament uh, scholar. Uh, this is probably conveying a similar idea, except we have seven because it's better. Um, there were limits on who would be authorized to open these scrolls. Generally, this would require someone with authority. And in this case, there's this search that takes place. And the search is like, it is everywhere. So they're searching in heaven, they're searching on the earth, and they're searching under the earth. I, I don't know who they were looking for under the earth to open the scroll, if it was mole people. Um, but they were definitely looking under the earth. Uh, now, there's also writing on both the inside and the outside, according to the, that Revelation 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 1. It's likely that the writing on the outside of the scroll served as a, as a kind of summary of the contents of the scroll, which means that John probably knows at this point roughly what the scroll entails. So he's weeping because he knows what's in this scroll and what would take place if there were somebody found worthy to open the scroll. And again, they looked everywhere for somebody to open that scroll. Um, th this isn't like a minor search. This is a, uh, this is a major search, probably involving search dogs, lots and lots of search dogs to find somebody who is worthy to open that scroll. And then we have the lamb. So we have 
one who's described as a, as a lion of Judah, root of, root of David, uh, lion of the, the, the tribe of Judah, root of David. Um, but when John turns and looks, he doesn't see what we'd expect. I, I, I mean, you're thinking root of David, you're thinking uh, lion of the tribe of Judah. You're, you're not thinking of, of what we actually, what John actually ends up seeing, because who would expect that? You're expecting somebody with maybe, you know, a sword, maybe three swords, I don't know. Uh, maybe somebody with a, with a, a, a number of guns, uh, somebody who's really jacked. Uh, and, and, you know, because he, he's, he's this conqueror, he's triumphed. But when John turns and looks, that's not what he sees. He doesn't see a lion. He doesn't see a, a figure who looks like David who has managed to, you know, take out a number of groups who were threatening his people, you know, through violence, he sees a slain lamb. The violence is done to the lamb rather than the, the lamb doing violence to others. And it is this slain lamb who receives worship. And, and again, it's surprising. We, we don't expect that. We don't expect to see that the language there isn't, isn't training us to think that as John turns, he's going to see a slain lamb. And John is told, when John is told that there's one worthy to open the scroll, that, it's called, that he's called the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, and the one who's triumphed, uh, again, we, we don't expect that. In our culture today, we don't expect that. Our average action movie, if we're seeing somebody talk like this, we're not expecting to see a slain lamb. We're expecting to see somebody like Rambo, maybe, show up. But we see a slain lamb. And the slain lamb is sitting at the center of the throne room in, the, in, in this place of authority, where the one seated on the throne is. He's, in essence, equal with the one seated on the throne. And he's the only one who's found worthy to open the, the scroll. He's the only one with the authority to open the scroll. And again, it's just surprising and it's amazing that the one who triumphs, the one who conquers, it, it is a slain lamb. He conquers because he was slain, because he was slain for us, because of his blood slain, shed for us. Now, we see the seven spirits of God again. In this case, they're described as seven spirits of God sent out into the earth. So that's another image. They're, they're the seven eyes um, on the lamb. The, the seven horns are like really referring to his authority, this, this complete authority. And uh, again, John likes the number seven. Uh, so again, we see these seven spirits, again, likely referring to the Holy Spirit. In, in other words, we, we actually see the entire Trinity in these two chapters. We see the one seated on the throne, we see the uh, lion who is the lamb, and we see these, these seven spirits of God all in this throne room and, and all effectively having, having authority. Um, so uh, again, we, we, worship, we worship a God who is Trinity, and, and we see that in, in this passage. So as, as we, we start, coming up, start going forward from here, I, I think it's going to be really good for us to think about, think about worship. Who are we worshiping? We worship the three in one God, the, the God who is here described as the one seated on the throne, the slain lamb, and the seven spirits of God. Um, we worship a God who is Trinity, and we worship a God who reigns both in heaven and upon earth. He's not a God who just reigns in, in one spot or over very little. He reigns over heaven and on earth. He reigns in our situations. Um, we, we have but to pray. Uh, we worship a God who triumphs not by conquest, which is what the Roman emperors would have done. Uh, Domitian, you know, he, he prosecuted plenty of wars. Um, th this isn't what, what Jesus ultimately did. Jesus didn't prosecute a war against the Romans. Um, we, we, don't, we don't see that happening in the Gospels. In the Gospels, instead Jesus is arrested and is beaten and is put up on a cross. And in that, his death on that cross, he, he triumphs over, ultimately over the Romans. And we see that happen several hundred years later when the, the Roman Empire becomes Christian. Um, and so he triumphs as this slain lamb. He conquers as a slain lamb. 
not, not the same way that the Roman emperors would, con would, would conquer by turning others into slain lambs, possibly, or just slaying other people. So the one who died for our sins and in doing so won the victory over sin and death is that lamb. He wins the victory over sin and death by his own death. Then why are we worshiping? Well, we worship a God who was and is and who is and is to come. So we worship because of who God is. We, we see that, we see songs here talking about God's holiness. The holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and is to come. And it, it's just sung and chant, or chanted day and night, all the time. And then, for that matter, Revelation uh, chapter 5, verse 13, where both the one seated on the throne and the Lamb are given praise and glory and power forever and ever, just because of who they are. But more than that, we worship because of what God has done. Um, if he was just a God who was in heaven and there was no, no connection with earth with him doing anything, I, I don't know that we would have much reason to worship because we probably wouldn't have the scriptures because we wouldn't have any revelation of him. Um, but we worship because of what God has done. He's given us scriptures. He's given us the, his son. His son came to die for us. And he's given us a, a revelation of his son in, in revelation. So we, we see that the one seated on the throne is worshipped, is worthy to be worshipped, partly because he's the creator in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. We see that the lamb is worthy to open the scroll because he was slain and purchased people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. That's Revelation chapters, uh, five, uh, chapter, five, nine, chapter 5, verse 9. Um, the list of four is important here, like it having to do with completeness. So it's, he's purchased people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Again, every tribe, language, people, and nation. He has purchased a people for himself. Not just from one tribe, not just from one language, so not just English, we, we'll see a bunch of other languages. And not just from one people or one nation, but from Every one of them, he has purchased a people for himself. <clears throat> and again, we see worthy is the lamb who was slain. He's worthy because he was slain. Which isn't, which isn't something we would typically think about. Who, who thinks, oh, I got killed, so I'm worthy. Or, oh, somebody was killed, so they're, they're worthy of praise. We, we don't generally think that. And they didn't generally think that back then. Uh, <clears throat> the emperor wouldn't be worthy to be praised because he was slain. Um, he, he thought he was worthy to be praised because he was the emperor of the one of the largest empires, if not the largest empire on earth at that time. Um, but we see that, that God turns that completely upside down, that he, the, the lamb is worthy because he was slain for us. And then we worship because of what God is doing. So God is working in and through us as a kingdom and priests hasn't ended. So he's, he's made us a kingdom and priests, and that hasn't ended. That continues on. God continues to draw us into his kingdom where we act as mediators of him to others so that others can be drawn into his kingdom. That, that is one of our chief tasks, even in worship, um, worship outside of singing, is to draw others to him um, as mediators of him, because we, we, we worship him in our singing and in our lives. And, and then we, we see that in God's work in the world through listening to our prayers, and that's not over. Revelation 5, 8, 5, 8, chapter 5, verse 8, mentions that each of the 24 elders holds a golden bowl with incense, and that this incense is the prayers of God's people. These prayers that like rise up to, to heaven, rise up as this, this incense, incense, this good smelling incense to God. Um, I, a number of you probably do like smelling incense, so think of that as you think of our prayers rising up to God. Or think of even, if you like brownies, think about the smell of brownies cooking in the oven, that, that, that this smell is rising up to God, is pleasing to God. Brownies, cake, I don't know, barbecue. Uh, think about that all rising up, up to God. That, that, that's our prayers rising up to God. 
It, it's not something he, he doesn't care about listening to or doesn't care about, but it, it's rising up to God, and it's the, the, this, this good-smelling smell to God. So, um, just a call to action. So, as you worship, and again, this is singing and um, in, in your daily life. It's, it's, it's not separate, it's together. So, as you worship, remember, we serve a God who is enthroned in heaven, who has calmed the raging sea to the point of making it look as if it's crystal. That, that's amazing. And as you worship, remember that we serve a lion, who was slain as a lamb for us, and as a result, is worthy of our worship. And as you worship, remember that we serve the one who was and who is and is to come, the Almighty. He is worthy of our worship. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, I, I ask that you would remind us daily uh, of who you are, of what you've done, and what you are doing, that... You've done amazing things for us. You've done amazing things for others. Uh, and you continue to do amazing things. Lord, let us, let us worship you in our daily lives. Let us worship you in song and in prayer and in our reading of scripture. Lord, let our lives be ones of worship before you, the, the lamb who was slain. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can find more resources for this service at nhgj.org. Email us your prayer requests to prayer at nh4gj.org. If you are a new follower of Jesus, we have a free resource for you called Following Jesus. To receive a copy, send a request to info at nh4gj.org. If you would like to partner with our ministry through giving, you can do that online at nhgj.org giving or by mail to 641 Horizon Drive, Grand Junction, Colorado, 81506. Thank you for being with us and may the Lord bless you.